Hello and welcome to Doubles and Trebles. We're back with another anti-post preview and it's a big one. The Epsom Derby, the most important race on the flat racing calendar. And it's going to be a slightly different approach to our Guineas anti-post preview as we're recording this after the key trials have been run. So hopefully a little bit more relevant information for you throughout the video uh, will, of course, depend on the date you are watching this. And hopefully you are tuned in for the foreseeable. So the most recent trial which we've had was the Dante at York at time of speaking. So uh, in planning for this, we were expecting Smino to talk about Luxembourg, the uh, winter favourite for this race. We've talked about the horse a couple of times already on previous videos and that uh, position as favourite in the market had only been strengthened by a typical kind of derby horse run in the 2000 guineas. But a week after that perfectly good effort, Luxembourg was found to be lame and as a result will not be running at Epsom. So the Luxembourg news and the conclusion of the trials has seen a big shake up in the market, as you would expect. So I guess before we start, just a quick work, a quick word on all that, really. Yeah, so it is a shame, really. Um, Luxembourg, like you say, ran a perfect looking Derby trial um, in the Guineas, finished third, um, stay, staying on, if you like, and was basically running in the wrong race because he's not particularly bred to be a miler and he got beat by two out and out top uh, top notch milers by the looks of it in Caribus and Native Trail. And as a result of that, he was five to two ish, nine to four for the Derby after that running the Guineas. But then, like you say, a couple of weeks later, he was. Uh, they put out a bit of a warning that he was lame and then it came out that, yeah, he's lame. It's not a bad injury, but he's not going to make the derby. But to be honest, on Luxembourg as an individual, I think that's the best thing that could have happened to him. Um, not in terms of being injured. It's not a bad injury. But in terms of not running in a derby, I don't I don't think he's a derby horse. I've always I've always thought that he wouldn't stay that far. Um, there was massive question marks over his breeding, whether he would stay that far as well. And um, yeah, it's kind of put a different... You know, he was, I think, after the Luxembourg news, it was seven or eight to one the field uh, with a month out, to, with a month to go to the Derby, which is, you know, we don't normally see that. We normally see a strong contender. Luxembourg was that contender, but now he's not. But yeah, I don't want to uh, lull on his, uh, on the Luxembourg story too much, but I think he's a 10 furlong horse and watch out for him in the Irish champion stakes in September. I'm lucky enough to be there and I think that's the race for him and he, he might well go close in that. Well, you will see firsthand if you are right then. So we'll uh, we'll move on from Luxembourg and concentrating on those that are due to run at Epsom. And now at the top of the market, are dominated by the two recent trial winners that I did reference before. So Desert Crown is your nine to four favourite at time of speaking uh, after winning the Dante with Stone Age three to one just in behind after winning the Leopardstown Derby trial. So both of those performances come in just in the last few days and both pretty impressive, Adam. Yeah, yes, they were. And they deserve their position at the top of the market. It's no surprise that the um, Leperstown Derby trial winner, usually by Aidan O'Brien, I think he's won it. He's, the amount of times he's won it is in the teens. Um, uh, used to be called the Derrinstown in Ireland. Um, yeah, he won that on the Sunday pretty well uh, from the front and, and, and went clear. And then just a few days later... Um, Desert Crown, uh, who was the talking horse, went on to to win the Dante. Drifted on the day, but um, but got the job done in lovely lovely fashion. So I'll start with concentrating on Desert Crown. Um, before his run in the Dante, trained by Sir Michael Stout, I thought he was the most wrong anti-post price I'd seen this year. And um, last year, Prime Man, I spent a lot of time telling you how wrong Santa Barbara was priced anti-post for the Guineas and the um and the and the Oaks. And I was I ended up being right about both. She was a ridiculous price. This was nearly as ridiculous. Um. Desert Crown was as low as six to one and not far behind on the exchange as well. Backed up by the exchange, if you like. Um, he was as low as 7.4 to lay for the derby, uh, having only had one run in his life. I was tweeting as much um, and now I've been made to made to look a bit foolish because he, he then went on to win the Dante and he's now two to one favourite. But I still maintain that that was a mad price at the time. He won a Nottingham Maiden in November last year. Um, so he was only seen once. He's obviously made his debut quite late in the year, November. There's not many places you can go with a good flat horse in November or after that until the next year. Um, he won that lovely by over five lengths. He'd not been seen since. Um, and new, numerous trials had been contested. So it was, um, there was, I think what was happening in this prime man is there was obviously some good reports about Desert Crown back home, uh, well-bred. So Michael Stout, Ryan Moore had been down to to, to ride him, although he won't ride him in races. Um, so there was some, there was obviously some good vibes out there. It was about forty to one at the turn of the year, and then he'd, he'd kept coming in. But what was happening is trials at Chester, Lingfield, and elsewhere. There wasn't a runaway or an impressive winner, so his price was just coming in by default, and he ended up, like I say, at six to one, which I thought was was absolutely mad. But how wrong was I? I mean, the dogs had clearly been barking as they say and yeah he'd, he'd come in he rocked up at the Dante for just his second start um 
he was pretty weak in the betting. The vibes were that, you know, he'd had a setback earlier in the year, nothing major, but, you know, he'd missed a, he'd missed a few days and he, he wasn't going to be 100% fit. But you probably wouldn't want him to be 100% or any horse to be 100% in a derby trial. You want him to be right in the derby. Um, but, yeah, um, he was weak. He went pretty weak on the day. He shored up a little bit towards the off, went off 7-2 joint fa- favourite. Still and a just, big price in it for the week. Yeah, I mean, seven to two joint favourite to win a trial when he's only six to one at, uh, to win the derby. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? Um, but it was visually dominant in the Dante. Settled, travelled, quickened up, um, put the race to bed before getting a bit lonely in front. It drifted across the track slightly. It's, that's nothing to worry about if you ask me. Um, so Michael Stout has won the derby three times. All three of them horses that he won the derby with ran in the Dante. Two of them won the Dante. One of them was placed, but then went on to win the derby. Um, Royal Patronage was second. He set a decent enough form standard in the Dante. It was a group three winner at two. Um, and he was a decent enough six in the Guineas. Um, first time up this year, obviously stepping up um, to the Dante. And he was nearly four lengths behind um, Desert Crown on the day. I mean, other than Royal Patronage, of course, we can pick some holes in the form. There were some disappointments in behind. But that's that's racing. I mean, Royal Patronage sets a decent standard. I think that Desert Crown will go off favourite. There does seem to be a swell of support behind Sir Michael Stout. Um, he's seventy odd years old now. I think he's seventy six. Um, he's had a couple of quiet years. He's still been. He's still had some decent horses and that. But he's had. He's been a while since he's had a Derby contender. Put it that way. So, um, yeah. There, I was there at York on on Thursday, and yeah, there was. There seems to be plenty of support for him. Um, moving on to Stone Age, who's the second favourite in the market, who you've mentioned, Pai Money's 3-1, either the leading um, Bally Doyle slash Aidan O'Brien contender at, at this stage. Um, there's always one, and he's got plenty of other contenders that we'll come on to. Um, although, being the Bally Doyle number one in the betting for the Epsom derby doesn't always tell the full story. Aidan's won six of the last ten derbies. Fantastic. Uh, but four of them were not favourite. Um, uh, four of them were not Aidan's shortest price runner. Um, he often has the favourite, but for, yeah, four of his last six winners haven't been his shortest price um, runner. Um, he's had winners of 25 to 1 and 40 to 1 over that period as well. So we're going to come on to some other Aidan O'Brien contenders. There's plenty of them. Don't be put off by the second or third choice jockey or a big price. Wings of Eagles was 40, 40 to 1, for example. Um, I was going to say, history tells us never yeah. to be put off by that. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah. So back to Stone Age. Um, he's got a very different profile to Desert Crown. Very different. He ran five times last year, Stone Age, without winning, which is a surprise for, for an O'Brien horse. Normally they mop up a maiden, but he was contesting, you know, a lot of group twos and a lot of group ones. Um he well, contested a group two and two group ones towards the back end of last year, placed in a group one. Um, he's looked a different horse at three. Um, he's won both of his starts this year by a combined 14.5 lengths. Um, the first one was a maiden, and then the second one was that um, uh, derby trial at Leopardstown by five and a half lengths. He's been from the front on both occasions. He went a long way clear when asked to do so at Leopardstown. Um, it could be even better at Epsom, where he's, where he's probably going to get a lead and probably from someone from his own stable, they'll they'll make someone lead the race and be a pace setter for him, and um, pro- probably do the donkey work for him. And, and Aidan said that he, he could well be better when he gets a lead. Um, a fascinating contender, bred out of the purple, as you can imagine. But it is good. It's quite interesting that the two at the top of the market, one of them's only had two starts, the other one's had seven. It is really, you know, it's you know, what do you want? Experience or a bit of, you know, I mean. You can't say that Stone Age isn't exciting. Like I say, he's won two races this season by 14 and a half lengths. But Desert Crown's the one that really does capture the imagination. He, he, he ran like there's a lot more to come from it from him. And it, like I say, he's only had two starts and there could well be a long way to go in his career. Mm, and quite tightly matched in the market. I think that's interesting what you say about potentially getting the uh, the lead with less trouble in terms of uh, at Epsom. You, you know, it, when you're in a yard of that kind of depth of the O'Briens, it's a real... Uh, novelty to be able to have a runner that's purely there to set the pace, isn't it? And uh, we see it time and time again in these big races. But we've talked about the big two in the market, but you still haven't really got off the fence. So if I gave you a tenner to back one of them, where would you be going right now? I'm guessing Desert Crown. Yeah, it would be Desert Crown. Um, there is a bit of disparity in the price, like say 94 and 3 to 1, but not not too much. But yeah, it would be Desert, Desert Crown. That's not to dismiss Stone Age. He looks, he looks a good horse. I can't really pick too many holes in him, but... Um, I think that Desert Crown beat better horses in the Dante than what Stone Age did in his respective um, trial most recently. It's not to say the Dante form was brilliant. I've already gave you a, picked a couple of holes in it. There was a, um, a horse in the Dante called El Berdigan that won a Group 1 in France last year that basically didn't turn up at York. But I just think, um, it, yeah, the Dante form, not brilliant, but better than, than the Stone Age one. Um, it just screams as if there's a lot more to come, Pine Man, the, the, the Desert Crown. Um, 
like I say, the, I've said before, the Dante was his second start. He wouldn't have been fully wound up for that for obvious reasons. He's, he's really, really exciting and, and he does look the one to beat to me. Mm. Yeah, moving on from the top two then, Aidan O'Brien, we talk about him and, and Ryan Moore mopping up in the uh, classic trials on English courses last week. Ryan Moore riding superbly. Changing of the guard and star India both won at Chester and we saw United Nations uh, going at Lingfield. So which of those trio impressed you the most? I'd have to say um, changing of the guard out of those uh, those three that mentioned. Um, he just led all the way in a four-run at um, Chester Vars. Um, changing of the guard and United Nations have a bit of a similar story to tell to each other. They both came up against Godolphin horses that were odds, odds on. Um, and changing of the guard and United Nations were second favourite in their respective races, but they put the Godolphin um, hot shots to bed uh, between them. Um, Changing of the guard, the further he went, the better he looked. He led all the way around at Chester, one by six and a half lengths. New London went off odds on favourite that day, but lost his unbeaten record. Um, New London just looked like he hated Chester, to be honest. It was always turning. He never looked really looked comfortable. Um, yeah, you'd have to be visually impressive by changing of the guard, but the substance to the form possibly doesn't look up to much to me. Um, it, it, it might sound ridiculous to say that um, changing of the guard could be a pace setter at Epsom. He's eight to one for a favourite, but... It could be um, on to United Nations. He sweated up um, qu- quite a lot um, before going to the Lingfield um, Derby trial, which so that might be a bad sign for Epsom with the atmosphere and the cauldron uh, of Epsom and the experience of it. Um, it's a, they have to walk a long way to the start at Epsom and then run back, obviously. Um, United Nations was in a prolonged battle with Walker Stars late on, so you'd be surprised if that, you know, You'd be surprised if that form was good enough to win a derby. And I say that because Walk of Stars has only come there on the back of a, uh, you know, an, an, a novice win where that and that form has already been knocked back as well. Um, yeah, he went off odds on. I noted Charlie up his co- comments a couple of weeks ago. He said that he's learned a lesson from last year that he prefers the Lingfield Derby trial to the likes of the Dante. Charlie Appleby didn't even have a run in the Dante this year because Lingfield is most similar track to Epsom. Epsom is very much unique, but Lingfield gets closest out of it, out of any other track in this country. Um, and he wished that he'd sent Hurricane Lane, who finished second in the Derby last year, mm-hmm. um, to. Um, he wishes that he sent him to. Um, he wishes that he sent him to Lingfield last year. So that's maybe one to one keep eye out on the future. Um, but yeah, United Nations. It was only his fourth start. He showed inexperience, and you know he, he was. He was. He came on. He, he ran a nice race, United Nations. But is he going to be good enough? Probably not. Similar comments probably apply to Star of India. It looked a decent renewal of the D Stakes. To be fair, it's only a listed event. Whereas the Chester Vars, which changing the guard one, also at Chester is a Group Three. So normally the D Stakes is a lesser race, but it looked decent this year. There's some good looking horses in there. Um, but I'm not sure if he's good enough to be winning the Derby. It looks more of a stayer to me. Um, it Crester actually. A horse called Crester is the one I took out of that race. Um, he looks to be still learning on the job um, and might be better with a more conventional track. But you'll be surprised if Star of India was good enough to win an Epsom Derby, to be fair. Mm. Yeah, so not exactly uh, rousing endorsements for any of that trio. And look, if, if we take a slightly alternative angle on things, there's plenty that will still say that the best trial for the Derby is the Guineas. And I guess there's two that fit that bill in, in Edon and Point Lonsdale. But we're getting into that kind of 20, 25 to 1 range, which is uh, my kind of party, your kind of party. Are they the forgotten horses potentially in this anti, anti-post market? Yes, they are, Pyman. That's that's 100% correct. Um, both raced on the wrong side. It was quite a big field at the, at the 2000 Guineas. Caribus came from the far side. Native Trail, who was beaten, I think it was um, second, um, raced on the near side. And it, it looked like that that in that race and that weekend that far side was the best place to be. Now, Edon and Point Lonsdale were both on the, the wrong side, as it were, on the day. Um, Point Lonsdale was actually really well backed on the day. He went off 11-2, to two, four favourite for the Guineas. He was 10-1 to one in the morning. So, um Someone someone obviously thought he had a chance on the day, but he was actually ham- hampered just before the furlong pole when he was starting to quicken. Now, he wasn't going to win, and it was Native Trail, the eventual second, that did hamper Point Lonsdale and Frankie de Torre, who rode Point Lonsdale down tools thereafter. Um, but yeah, he was leading the, the near side group, Point Lonsdale, for some way. Um, and Aidan O'Brien always said he was a Derby horse. All last year and all this year, he said he's a Derby horse. So I do think he could be the forgotten contender, but there's a spanner in the works, Pie Man. Point Lonsdale, as we speak now, is any price you want on the exchange because I think he is likely to go for the French derby. So I would, I certainly wouldn't be advising to back Point Lonsdale as we speak. But if he was to turn up on the day, or if the race was tomorrow and he was twenty-five to one, mm. I'd back Point Lonsdale, no problem at all. And um, 
Edon, the other one that you mentioned in there, um, he could also end up in France. There's a question mark over, over his participation at Epsom, but he ran a lovely race in the Guineas. He actually won the Field and Stakes, which is um, at the Craven meeting. That's traditionally a race uh, that, that edges towards the Derby over nine furlongs. Then he dropped back to eight furlongs for the Guineas and finished fourth. Again, similar to Luxembourg, very much a look like a Derby contender running over too short a distance. Um, he's really interesting, Edon, and I, he will go off a lot shorter than 20 to 1 if he was to turn up, but the 20 to 1 factored into that is the likelihood that he may well stay over 10 furlongs and go to France instead. And Point Lonsdale might join him there. Yeah, there's one that I should really touch on now after we've discussed those two, and uh, I just can't not mention Frankie de Tori given the record that he has in these, in these classic races, and we've seen him today be confirmed for quite a, a bit of a surprise ride, is it fair to say? Yeah, I would say so, yeah. Um, a contender called Piz, Piz Badil, um for um, Donica O'Brien. Plenty um, of money for it off the back of the news as well, of course. Yeah, yeah, he's, he was 10 to 1 this morning, Piz Badil. It's come out that Frankie's going to ride him. He's now into 8 to 1. Gavin Ryan has rode Piz Badil on all three of his, all three of his starts. I mean, it's difficult to say for who is now a Hall of Famer. Frankie de Tori won this race out two or three times, won the Oaks last year on Snowfall, which at the time was a second choice for, for Aidan O'Brien. But yeah, Piz Badil, um has only ran once this year um, and he's only ran three times in his life. There's normally two tri- two key derby trials in Ireland. One of them is the Derrinstown that uh, that Stone Age won. And normally the horse that the horses that run well or win or a race called the Ballysack Stakes, which is in early April, also running the Derrins Town, then run over in the, into the Derby. Well, Piz Badil, trained by Donna Crowby and out of Ulysses, who is quite a new start, new sire, won the Judmont and the Eclipse a few years ago in the same year. Um, yeah, he, he's going to go straight from uh, April the 2nd to June the 4th um, for the Epsom Derby, which, you know, wouldn't be my way of doing it, but I'm not a qualified horse trainer, as you know, Pine Man. But yeah, Piz Medil got um, really in a cracking race with a, a horse called Buckaroo, who, who I do really like. And there was quite a long way um, clear of the third on that day. Piz Medil got headed by Buckaroo, trained by Joseph O'Brien. And Donica O'Brien's Piz Medil battled back under Gavin Ryan um, right near the rail and got up just just on the line. It was a, it was a really good, good race visually to watch. Um, I don't think the form's up to much, if I'm honest with you. Um, there's a few horses in there that are all rated in or below 100 at the moment so I don't think they're up to much but they've got their they've got the word in nice and early that um that Frankie de Tori is going to ride him I'm going to feel for Gavin Ryan this horse has only had three starts he's rode it three times first second and first I mean yeah I mean but we've seen this happen the brutal game, Dittori, isn't it? yeah <laughs> we've seen it happen before Pyman, it happened last year there was a horse called John yeah. Leeper that ran I think uh, I'm testing my memory now it ran really well with uh, one of the new market racers right um and it went to it went to Epsom, and Adam Kirby had ridden um, John Leeper in a few starts up to it. Frankie de Tori ended up riding. The owners, apparently, the owners decided they was going to let Adam Kirby sit on the sidelines, and Frankie de Tori ride John Leeper. I think it went off about ten to one. But I tell you what happened last year, Pyman. Adam Kirby then picked up a ride on the yes. third choice Godolphin horse that was fifty to one in the morning of the race, and went off sixteen to one and won. So what well, goes around yeah. in this game comes around. But yeah, Piz Badil is going to be a contender. At least that definitely tells us that he's going to be running, given that they've confirmed um, they've confirmed uh, Frankie de Tori so early at this stage. But yeah, I just think it's a big ask to go from April the 2nd until and, and all the way until Epsom. Um, but yeah, he's going to be a contender. He's around eight to one. He's probably the fourth favourite as we speak. Mm-hmm. Yeah, very interesting contender now and another layer to what is a fascinating market. One more, we'll touch on one more and then I'll, I'll maybe ask you for, for a kind of conclusion. But cash, a big price, 25 to 1, but got, certainly had plenty of people talking after that run at Sandown a few weeks ago. Could he be a player potentially? Yeah, he's a, he's a wild card by, by by his very nature. Um, it was just his second start at Sandown. He did virtually everything wrong, Pine Man. He played up before the start. He virtually refused to go in. He was outpaced at the back. He was green in between horses when challenging. A lot went wrong. But when he when he knuckled down, he went and the penny dropped. He he went really well. He was only beaten a short head. Um, I thought he was. I thought he was really quite an interesting contender. He's another one. He's only had two starts. Like he is a massive wild card. You're in that cauldron as, as at Epsom, as I've already mentioned. It would be a worry if he's reluctant to go to the start or reluctant to go in the stores. He could blow the race before it starts. The winner that day was a horse called Westover. Um, 
he's certainly bred for the job. Um, there's no reason why, why you shouldn't be running him, in my opinion, Westover for, for Ralph Beckett. He won that race at Sandown, um, the classic trial at Sandown, which last year's winner ran in the Sandown race. I think he was second or third. Um, but yeah, um, the knife were certain to, to to line up just because of lack of experience for, for both of them. But I thought the, the, there was some substance to that um, Sandown form. You had Cash in there, Goldspur, who, 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 who went close in a couple of Group Ones in in France last year as well. Um, yeah, I think they, I think either of them turn up. Um, they, they could um, possibly spring a surprise or want to get the places. But experience is going to be the key for those guys. Mm. I should just sort of ask you then, we'll, we'll come towards uh, talking uh, certainly about the majority of the top contenders. It dominated it by the top two at the top of the market, but would there be one at a bigger price that you would lean towards at this stage? We've talked about Point Lonsdale perhaps going elsewhere uh, according to the exchange, but any any sort of big price hint? Yeah, when I was doing my notes, it would have been Point Lonsdale, Pyman, and it, like I say, if the race was tomorrow, it still would be Point Lonsdale, but the exchange suggests he's going elsewhere and certainly won't be running at, at Epsom if the 110 on the exchange is to be believed. Um, so, yeah, it's going to be a reasonably boring pick and it would be it would be Desert Crown at this stage. I've just said I've just um, said the last two haven't got enough experience and Desert Crown's only had two starts, but I do think it's fascinating between the, between the two at the, the top of the market. I think they're definitely the ones to beat and you know, every year we get horses that that win at Chester and Lingfield and then turn up here and invariably don't do very well. I mean, sometimes you have to just keep it simple. There's the main trial in Ireland. There's the main trial in England, which is the Dante. We've had an impressive winner of the Dante on only just his second start. There's lots more to come. Visually, they look like there's lots more to come. And coming out of the trainer's mouth, he said there's a lot more to come as well. I'm going to believe a man who's trained three Derby winners. Um, and yeah, I do like I do like Desert Crown. And one thing I would say about Desert Crown is Richard Kingscoat. He's got a pretty new partnership with Michael, Sir Michael Stout last couple of years. Mm-hmm. He was with Tom Daskin for years and years, um, both of which have moved on now from the Michael Owen stable in the Northwest. Um, but yeah, Richard Kingscoat has been with, been on Desert Crown both starts so far, and I hope that he keeps the ride um, for the Derby. I have had a feeling that someone like Mr. Dottori might end up on Desert Crown. That isn't going to happen because he's been snapped up by Donica O'Brien for Pisba deal. So, yeah. Shout out to Richard Kingscote. He's only ever had one ride in the Derby um, and his second ride in the Derby is going to go off a lot shorter price than his first ride did. Yeah, Richard <clears throat> Richard Kingscote, a Haydock merchant. I remember him uh, oh, he's riding Haydock, yeah. many a two, three, four time oh, when I was up that way. That was the local track for a few years. Uh, yeah, it'd be nice to see him get that big ride and get that big win. Uh, yeah, fa- fascinating chat. It's a fascinating market. I'm sure we're going to cover it a couple more times before race day. If you've enjoyed this preview, do drop us a like and a comment. Check out our other content on the channel. Uh, There's plenty more racing and plenty more darts coming your way in the coming weeks. So it's a pleasure to have you here on Doubles and Trebles. If you haven't subscribed, do press that subscribe. We're approaching 500. That'll be a nice milestone for us. Why don't you help us get towards it? We'll see you again very soon. Let us know who you're backing in the comments and we'll be back again soon.